The only way to learn, as I've been told, is to to make sure that people can change the sentiment of your right to the sentiment of that's right. Business is messy and unpredictable. Sometimes lonely. So lonely. So lonely. <laughs> and inspiration can often come from really weird places. We pick up where the bullet point blogs and the highlight reels leave off. We start with the stories. Welcome back to So Here's My Story. I'm Jody. I'm Elliot. And for those of you who uh, check out the show notes and whatnot on our, our webpage, which is so here's my story.com, apparently we had some sort of glitch in our little posting thingy. And from episode 75 on, there were no episode pages. Really? Yeah. Didn't notice because um, we were doing all the things in the background, but uh, they weren't coming through on the other side. That's so not good. fortunately, someone let us know that. And, um, and that is all repaired now. So you can go there. There's a page for each episode with the show notes that Chris. Christy does such a good job on. And um, you can also find links to the Facebook group there, places you can subscribe, and also where you can get our special episode that's uh, that made our ex-intern Taylor blush a little. So Ex-intern. You make it sound like she left in a huff. She... <laughs> <laughs> no. Her internship was over. No, her internship yes. was over. So. Yeah. As we dive into this episode, you have a story, which I thought was really interesting because during- oh, good. Yes. So- <laughs> <laughs> right. Glad it so didn't this disappoint one was interesting. It, nicely, as to nicely the done. Um, but because you started out with a uh, the proverbial trip to grandmother's house <laughs> over the river, and over the, the river and through the woods, but apparently not past donkeys and stuff. Yeah. But anyway, so you started out with this trip, and the conversation really began to focus in an interesting place for me, which is the the nuance and art of delegation. Yeah, it's funny we didn't actually get to that. We didn't use that word until about three quarters of the way through. But the minute you said it, I'm like, that is what this is about. So really, the whole episode's about that. We just don't, we didn't realize that until like three quarters of the way. But now you can realize that. <laughs> exactly. You ready to go? Yep. So here's my story. And I have to like back up a tiny bit before the story to tell you a little bit about my son. So he's 16 now. Um, but he, you know, classic boy kind of thing. He's he's not always been the most focused or, you know, reliable really? for details kinds of things, which a I empathize 16 with. 16-year-old boy? Not... <laughs> no, we're talking about when he was little. Oh, you know, okay. So well, now he is. Kind of okay. classic ADD. Well, th this is actually part of the story. So okay. ADD, ADD, you know, whatever. Um, just also boy, like, you know, and kind of just really easygoing and doesn't get to up in arms about most things, even things that he should or whatever. So there were many, many, many years of his childhood where getting even just out of house in the morning involved like, you know, Turner, you put your shoes on, put Turner, put your shoes, Turner, put you, can you, do you have, could you put your shoes on? Can you put your shoes on? <laughs> and he would forget in the moment that he turned sure. his shoes on. So we have grown out of a lot of that. And he is actually, you know, he's a sophomore in high school and he is like the picture of, I mean, I've just been so impressed with how, and, and this is not to all brag about my son. This is because wait till I get to the punchline of story. <laughs> I just have to set up this sort of swing where where he's really matured a lot. He's I don't have to get on him about homework. He, I don't have to get on him about like things that are coming up. He doesn't pull that like, oh, hey, I forgot to tell you I need two dozen cookies this morning as we're walking out the door. Like he's just become really reliable. Okay. So that huge part of my brain that used to monitor and stay on top of and make sure that basic things got done it has has been has been subletted out to other things now because he's he's kind of on his own and he does a lot on his own. I don't have to watch over him that much. So let me go back to Thanksgiving of this past year. Okay. <laughs> Our story are, begins. Our story begins. But you have to know that sort of like development of someone. So we go back to Thanksgiving. We're all packing. We're rushing around because there were some things going on in our lives at the time. And I had both the kids packing for themselves. And my daughter has been able to pack a reliably perfect suitcase since she was like three years old. Like she gets exactly all the right things. It's weird. Um, but I said, Turner, have you got your stuff together? And he did say something like, the clothes I want aren't clean or something like that. And I said, well, just grab them. We're going to your grandma's house. We can wash them once we get there, whatever. We're going for Thanksgiving. So <laughs> we get in the car. We drive the six hours to my grandmother's house. And we, we stop. We're getting out of the car somewhere to go to the bathroom or grab some food or whatever. And I'm in the back. And I'm like, Turner, where's your, where's your suitcase? I, I was like, do you not have another suitcase? And he goes, no. I'm like, well, 
wear your clothes. And, and this is a visual. He sort of like takes one step back and sort of gestures at his body. <laughs> Like the, he's the, got clothes. He's got clothes. As you and, can plainly see, I am not <laughs> naked. Like, I have clothes. And I was like, wait, the, the, are those your only clothes? And he said, well, I told you my stuff wasn't clean. So therefore. <laughs> yeah. So yes. therefore, henceforth and subsequently, <laughs> he brought no clothes for, I will tell you, a four and a half day trip, including Thanksgiving Day, where there's all these people coming and whatever. So hysterically, this part of me just wanted to, to rail at him um, because I'm like, what? Were you, <laughs> what was going on in there? And um, and to make up this, what is sort of rambling story slightly shorter, you know, he immediately, I was like, can we, can you at least, because he got defensive, of course, because I reacted and that's what teenage boys do. We got super defensive and, um, and then we kind of calmed it down. I was like, can you at least acknowledge that that was a not well thought out decision? <laughs> and he's like, Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm like, okay, let's just at least start there. So we ended up stopping at Walmart and grabbing his things. But what I got, I'm grabbing some like basic clothes so that he wasn't wearing the exact same clothes for four and a half days straight, um, which he'd be perfectly fine doing probably. But it got me to thinking about sort of this duality, the two sort of traps at either end of managing people that I think can both be problematic. And one is not making space for them to evolve because I do sometimes, or the story of them to evolve, because I do sometimes make cracks about how great my daughter is at, you know, all the executive functioning kind of things and, and will sort of joke about my son when in reality, that's not a real story about him anymore. He's mm -hmm. he's actually incredibly responsible and and it's kind of come out of nowhere. So I can't even take take credit for it. It's just a maturity thing, I think. So that story has changed. And sometimes I forget and I tell like that old story or think of that old story. Yeah. And yet, <laughs> apparently it's not an entirely old story. Sometimes the old burbles up every once in a while. Right, right, right. So, so you know, the word micromanagement gets thrown around a lot in conversations that I'm in, and I'm sure you as well, and, and in leadership. And you know, whether you're talking about helicopter parenting or micromanaging your employees or whatever, the sort of amount at which you get involved in things. Because I, I end up hearing leaders talking a lot about kind of this pendulum swing back and forth between they'll swing way out and give people tons of autonomy and space. And then they'll be disappointed that something kind of got off the tr off the rails and they didn't see it. And then they'll swim way back into like monitoring every little tiny thing. And I think in reality, there's probably something in between the two. So it, it's sort of two things that came up. One is um, you know, making space for the story of people to change, but then not sort of flipping it over to the other side where now you're just completely hands off and you've abdicated any sort of oversight and, uh, and whatnot. So there's yeah, the and, story. And I think it's, I think it's important because I, I've seen this and I'll, I'll put it into my world. There are different stakes involved in projects. So for example, I can leave room for people to prepare for something, but I can't leave room for people to prepare um, for a trial without mm. my uh, oh, involvement okay. yeah. because it's yep. high stakes. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, an art and I've actually had to focus on this somewhat to to really look for as as an employer, as the manager of a company, to look for low and medium stakes issues mm -hmm. so that I can leave room on the low stakes thing because it's it, it can be easily repaired and I can leave stakes on the medium things so that um, by giving autonomy, it shows people that I do have faith in them, but it can still be repaired. But the high stakes for me would be if I said, and Lacey is terrific, but just use her ex as an example. If I said to Lacey, <laughs> okay, prepare for trial. And then I don't even look at anything until the night before trial when it's too late right. to figure out right. the witnesses and the exhibits and all that stuff. That's that's high stakes. I can't fix it and somebody else's interests are on the line, namely, right. namely my client. But there are certain things where I could fix it. If I said to, to Lacey, okay, prepare for this deposition and I, you know, get everything in line by Friday because the deposition's on Monday. I can look at it on Friday and it's medium stakes because I could fix it. I'm going to have to burn the weekend and fix right, it and right, do right. whatever, but it could be fixed. No, I think that's, there's, um, I think the parallels here to parenting are, are so many. There's, there's two parenting books that I love. One's called, um, the, 
beauty of a skin knee or blessing of a skin knee. It's something about a skinned knee and it's it's similar kind of thought of like letting letting them fall down and and get hurt. I've read nothing um, about parenting. <laughs> <laughs> and it shows That's daily. Okay. Um, the, the blessing of a skin knee, I think it is. And then the other one is the price of privilege, which is both of these come back to like, if you want them to be able to handle disappointment, you have to let them be disappointed. Or if you want them to be able to handle frustration, you have to let them be frustration, frustrated. And similarly, if you want somebody to be good at writing briefs or whatever, you have to let them have space. I'm way better at it at parenting than I am um, in any kind of management scenario. I'm, I'm much more um, kind of not set it and forget it, but I'm like, here's the big idea. I'll be back at the end of the year. Like, <laughs> um, and and it's it's hard for me to like pop back in and pop back out. But um, but I, but I do think this is. So how do you? Because I think that skill of deciding what's high stakes is is part of the art of it. So is it just in? Is that the only variable? Like high stakes, not high stakes. Cause you know, if I think about my son, I'm not going to let him go all the way through high school without checking in on how he's doing sort of like that high stakes of, of, of whatever. Ultimately at the end of the day, if he had only had one set of clothes for four days, it wouldn't have been the end of the world. I mean, we could no. have, you know, <laughs> thrown a gown on him and wash them at some point. Right. No, but, <laughs> but, um, I'll tell you, it's not even high, st high stakes and, and medium and low stakes. That's the like intellectual way of looking at it. I look at it in a much more simple equation, which is how badly am I going to be pissed off? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> how bad, how much is this going to affect my world? Well, and, and how, how much or how possible will it be to fix it? Cause I would imagine yeah. part of how pissed off are you is like, if, if it's gone out in a way that it's unrolled in a way that there's no time to fix it, you're going to be even more pissed off than, than if you can write like course correct it. But. Yeah. And it's also the nature of, of the issue. This, this feeds into how ticked off I was going to be, because if I think something is common sense or I've given specific instructions and then that's, um, it turned, that's part of the point of failure. Then I get, uh, much more irritated well beyond the stakes of the thing. And that's going to have repercussions on how much autonomy I give down the road. Hmm. But, but for the most part with me, it really is, okay, well, what are the impacts this is how I determine the stakes. What are the impacts? If it just impacts me and it means I have to spend more time, then that's not a big deal. Mm. If it impacts somebody else in the organization, if it impacts one of our clients or customers or whatever, if it impacts an outcome that we are trying to achieve, you know, beyond just, well, we want to get it out on time, but, but, um, some significant metric for the, for the business, then, then yeah, there's a limit to what I'm going to do. But, but here's the other thing that's a real challenge in my business. My business, like yours, is very, um, is geared toward the personal. In other words, hmm. even when I was litigation counsel for Walmart, Walmart used to tell me we don't hire law firms, we hire lawyers. Hmm. So it's very geared towards the personal. So people, when they generally call the law firm, um, at least for a long time, they they wanted me to do everything. They wanted me to, right. to be on the end of the phone. They wanted me to to be everywhere they they needed me to be. And so I had to figure out how to delegate. In order to delegate, I had to first allow people to have low stakes failure so I can see where they're mm. going to, mm -hmm. I can allow them to develop. Right. Because, and this is a common complaint with lawyers, with anybody that I've heard who has a personal type business. I want to be able to delegate, you know, all the time that's spent is my own. Well, okay, how do I do that? I have to have my get my customers to the point where they have faith in Susan or faith in whoever their, their other person is. How do you do that? Well, Susan has to get good at this. How do you do that? <laughs> well, yeah, no, it's true. It's true. Because if you, if you want to be able to delegate, I think there's a, oh, I, I think this is part of the art of it. Like you can think of tiny things to give somebody, but they won't, they won't develop a sense of and a responsibility for what matters about that if they aren't also somehow tied to like the next step. So, so when I was with the architecture firm, especially when we were much smaller, they would often give an entire, when, when possible, they would give an entire very small project to an up and coming intern architect. 
because it was small enough that the stakes weren't, you know, they were going to hand him a whole brand new high school, obviously, right, right. or her. Um, but there was this tiny little thing that still had every aspect of a project, but it was small enough that they could kind of frankly give you enough rope to let you hang yourself. But they were right yeah. there to sort of cut the rope or, you know, swoop in right. if they needed to. But because of that, you develop an appreciation for like, oh, when I don't think about this here, it comes back on me over here. Versus if, if you just give somebody that discrete task, it's, it's, you were kind of setting yourself up for the frustration of like, you can't be surprised that they don't necessarily completely understand all the things that task has impacts on and the way where it where it shows up later if it's this way or that way and you can't always give somebody an entire project obviously but i think the more you can look for things where they can experience all of it and they're like oh i see that that's going to come back to haunt me if i don't do this this and this things that seemed silly in the beginning um that you may have resisted but I think this allowing them to develop, allowing them to fail. My my husband, Paul, and I have often joked that we're like survival of the fittest parents. <laughs> we, yeah. we kind of just let people, let, let them figure it out as they go. Um, and I, and I think there's something to that for developing people. And, and if they're, if, if those people don't rise to that occasion, you know, if they aren't able to, to figure out the things you need them to figure out, I think it's also a good litmus test. But Yeah, it is. I mean, in terms of what's going to come back and haunt you, I, I always say to to uh, Alex, he's tired of hearing it, when he's got some spare time on, let's say, Friday, and he's not doing this thing, and he's got to get it done by Monday. And I'll say to him, I'm just telling you right now that Sunday Alex is going to hate Friday Alex. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You're really going to be upset at Friday Alex. Mm -hmm. But um, the the thing with with Turner in your story though is you delegated to him the the task of getting ready, getting his suitcase ready, and getting getting his clothes ready for this, uh, you know, for Thanksgiving at uh, at his grandparents and. You know, and that means that he's going to have room to fail. Mm -hmm. you, now, what you hope is that he can look back on it because, as they say, there's not much to be learned from the second kick of a mule. You know, so, <laughs> so they say that they I've, do. I've never do. heard anybody say that. Yes, but okay, yes. I'll trust you. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised because you come from West I don't Virginia. Even there quite seems, oh, hey, hey se well, easy. there seems to be a big mule population. I've, I'm I've just saying, I've never seen a mule in West Virginia. No way, whatever. you've never seen a mule in West Virginia. No. Really? No. I'm really calling on all of our West Virginia <laughs> listeners to send us your as mule pictures. Note, as a side note, I also saw my very first raccoon ever when I came to college in Baltimore. I'd never seen a raccoon before. Where are, I don't even know, other than <laughs> living to the right, to the right, to the right of the Morgantown We're, Mall wow, or whatever it is. Memory. But um, I don't even know if you're really living out in the country in West Virginia the way I pictured I it. I never said it was the country. No. Uh, well, it's I keep, more like the suburbs. Of I thought you thing. were raised in a tree house and, oh, you know, stop. Okay. That's, anyway. On a hill, yes, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Okay. So, so, yes, they say, all of them, all of them say that there's not much to be learned from the second kick of a mule. And what I mean by that is, what they mean by that is that. You would hope that somebody learns the lesson the first time, but you have ah. to give them that that freedom to fail because otherwise, if you're just if you spend the time before each trip to the grandparents or whatever lecturing Turner or giving him the laundry list, uh, literally laundry laundry <laughs> list of things that have to be done, and you do it for him and you narrate your life as you're doing it. Now I'm putting your socks in the suitcase. Now I'm doing this. Um, he can listen, just like you can listen to a lecture, you can listen to a keynote, but it doesn't, the only way to learn, as I've been told, is to, to make sure that people can change the sentiment of your right to the sentiment of that's right. That's a really, really great insight because one of the things that I noticed with Turner in this, because I was kind of perplexed, I was so shocked, I was so I, it, it just totally caught me off guard because I'm like, should, should I have seen this coming? Like, he's so responsible. But it occurred to me that the distinction, and this is totally appropriate for at the developmental stage of a 16-year-old boy. Um, so, this, 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 this part doesn't exactly apply to management, but, but the, the insight from it does. So, what Turner is extremely good at making sure he's wildly responsible for are all the things that he cares about. <laughs> 
at the end of the day, sense. Turner didn't really care if he wore the same clothes for four days. Straight. Correct. That so would be therefore, correct. Yeah. Therefore, he didn't try that hard to work out the wrinkle of my clothes are dirty. Yeah. Um, so, so that that was the awareness that was important for me as a you know proverbial manager in that moment of recognizing like, oh, okay, here's where the skill set this person has is working really well. Here's where it doesn't in these moments. And, you know, I, you either need to like help them see why the thing is important um, in a way that they care about, or at least that they're willing to accept is, has to be the way if, you know, I, I try at least in parenting and certainly in management as well to, to rely on because I said so as little as possible. Like I try to you know, find other ways in that door. But um, where I see this coming up, though, in an interesting way is I was recently speaking with a client who was really struggling with this person that um, you know, it was a it was a new I think everyone's seen this happen a lot of times. It was a new role that one that they had decided to add to a team. And it's not like your standard everyday role. They're like, well, mm-hmm. I think if we had somebody who could do this, it would really make everything better. Yeah. And so it's not working out as planned or as anticipated. And you know, with the sample size of one and two very unpredictable variables, it's a little bit hard to know, like, was the was the role just not, were we wrong about this role being the right mm-hmm. role that was needed? Or is the person right. the wrong person? Or yeah. is it both? Like, you know, you might get a new person in there and realize, nope, nope, it's the wrong role. Or, you know, and, and in an ideal world, it'd be really lovely to be able to know which one it is, yeah. but we kind of can't. Now, this person has been there for a while. And so I was speaking with their manager and we were discussing like how to step back in and try and course correct some of these things, make sure that the person's focusing on the right things and whatnot. And it was so interesting because there was so much resistance, partly from frustration, but resistance to swooping back in. Because again, this like tendency, we have to think of things in a binary way. Like she goes, well, that's not sustainable that I would always have to follow up with this person. I said, no, 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 no. We're, we're just... We're, we're trying to isolate the variable of can the person do the thing? Like, so if if you swoop in and for a week or two, you're making sure that the right things are prioritized and yeah. focused on and done and they rise to the occasion and that's working. And as you pull back, they swoop off into the background again, you'll have an answer. But, 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 but it's just so interesting where um, that story gets written. And then when there is a bump, I, I think part of what fascinated me about this is just the awareness that like the stories you're writing about people and how and what they need and what they don't need, and what they're good at and not good at needs to stay really fluid in order to develop them as a person. Right. Because the people themselves do not exist in a snapshot. Right. You know, and, and the Despite interesting- what Instagram might tell you. <laughs> right. But the interesting thing is when you started your story, you were saying that sometimes we categorize them that way. So Turner had, had uh, it had been a long time since Turner was really irresponsible and didn't really care about everything. And he evolved into somebody who is so responsible that you didn't really have to pay attention enough. Mm-hmm. But sometimes in telling your stories, comparing just for humorous effect, Turner and Kaya, you would trap Turner in that snapshot of where he was when he was yeah. nine. Yeah, I just whatever. forget sometimes. Yeah. But but in management, we tend to do that as well. You trap people in the snapshot of, well, she doesn't know how to do that. Well, because she didn't know how to do that for the first two months she was here. Well, and guess what? I think we trap people in the snapshot the other way around too. Like Bob's been a rock star for, I mean, we, right, we had an episode exactly. on this sort of like resting on your laurels of a story that's no longer the main story. You know, somebody yeah. knocks it out of the ballpark, but now they're frankly feather nesting and they're pretty comfy and they're like hung back and not really knocking it out of the ballpark. Or anymore. they knocked it out of the ballpark so much that they've been promoted. They're not familiar with this role, but they have so much pressure because you have this image yep. that they're always going to knock it out of the ballpark. So you don't give them the kind of direction you otherwise would. Yeah. And you, you've set them up to, to fail. So you have the, the, the nuance involved in delegation, I think is so fascinating. And, and what's interesting to me is that very, very frequently, at least in, in my experience and in speaking with clients, there isn't as much thought given to not only the stakes, you know, not only what we're delegating, but the fact that it's not a binary choice between micromanagement and hands off. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, that's that's absolutely true. And I think delegation, I almost want to do like a whole other a whole other episode now just on delegation. Which I'm sure we will. Which I'm sure I'm sure we will. But getting into the nuance of delegation is is exactly why I think it's so hard. Because just as a quick example, like I am I am the opposite of a control freak, as I was saying. I'm like, here's the big idea. I don't care how you get there, but this is what I'm trying to get at. Where I struggle in delegation is is trying to is trying to think how to package things up. Once I know like, oh, here's something that I could pass off to a person that's not like the whole thing, I'm happy to, to dump it off. But that sort of first step of, oh gosh, I don't even know what or how to communicate it all out. Whereas m- a lot of other people that I talk to who are trying to tackle the delegation thing have, have you know, they're, they're more like, well, I want it done the way I want it done. I'm like, oh, that's not my problem, but I have a totally different problem. So I, I think you know, if delegation, you know, if you're listening to this and delegation is something that that you struggle with and aspire to, I think paying attention to, maybe as we wrap up here, paying attention to what part of it you get stuck on and if there's anything you can do about that, what part maybe someone else could help from the other side to like take off your plate. And then when you have tried delegation, because that's always where people go when I talk to them about this topic, they're like, well, I tried it once and it didn't go well. Like, <laughs> They've got their little horror stories. Uh, paying attention to what role the story you had about the person played in whether or not that delegation worked. And and there's one other thought that I had while you were talking about that. If you delegate a lot, if it's not a sample size of one, if mm. you try to delegate a lot and it always fails, maybe the problem is you. So that's our story. But the discussion doesn't have to end here. No, it does not. In fact, we don't want it to. No, we don't. (laughs) That is why we actually have our private Facebook group. Which we started to make sure that we could get your comments, your rants, your thoughts. Your stories. Your stories. You can find links to that group as well as show notes and links to subscribe via email and how to find us just about anywhere you can possibly find podcasts at SoHere'sMyStory.com. And you can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at SHMS Podcast. And since we know it takes a village... Yes, it does. (laughs) We'd like to thank our village, our super talented, incredibly patient team. And occasionally snarky team. Yeah, but in the best of ways. In the best of ways. snarky. Yes. (laughs) Good mockery. So so a huge shout out to the people who actually help us produce our show. Uh, First, our sound engineer, Tom Hansen. Thanks to Christy Schmier for our brilliant show notes and all the other fantastic writing she does for us. And to Taylor Mathauer for doing just a little bit of everything. Including wrangling us. Including wrangling us. <laughs> Which is no small feat. No, it's not. This is Jody Hume. And I'm Elliot Wagenheim. And you've been listening to So Here's My Story.